without further ado, um, I'd like to hand you over to Wes, um, who's going to make a, a, an introduction. Sorry, Wes. Can you see those slides now, Andrew? Um, yes, I can. Yep, perfect, Wes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. I, I'll keep this brief. What, what I want to do is give a kind of broad introduction to the, the Moses project, and then, and then let Christina get into into what we did in the actual uh, Belfast case study. But just to give people some context about what the, the Moses project was about, it was a um, 2.2 million interreg project uh, led by NUIG by Dr. Stephen Hines. Uh, some of you will know Stephen from, from other work that he's done, particularly about the, the ocean economy reports that they've done for the Irish government uh, really show what kind of uh, a maritime economy uh, the, the, the uh, Ireland has de de developed and it's worth checking out. So we had eight partners from, from five countries and I, I won't list them all, but you can see our, our, our emblems there to the right. Uh, and it was meant to be a 36 month project, but it, it ended up being 42 months because of, because of COVID. Um, so we're coming towards the end uh, and we want to kind of re report back on, on what we found and this is one of the mechanisms through, through webinars. The overall aim of the project really was to look at the blue growth across the Atlantic arc. Um, so from, from Scotland down, down to Portugal uh, along, along that, that, that coastline. Uh, and we wanted to see how this could be made more sustainable. So we did this through kind of five interrelated work packages. Uh, the first one was looking at, you know, what's the current size uh, and trend uh, of the main marine sectors? building on a previous project uh, from 2012 that had done something similar. Uh, also look at what, what pressures on the, the marine environment these sectors uh, are, are having, um, identify some areas that are, are maybe vulnerable um, to these pressures, and then finally you know, not just point out that there's issues maybe with, with you know, uh, unlimited blue, blue growth, but also to de develop some solutions that could be reported back to the sectors. Uh, and that one about developing the pathways is you know, the, the package we were, were leading on. So this is how we kind of conceptualize it. Uh, and that bottom um, or rectangle is where we're, we're focusing on today, developing a transition pathway and communicating back to the stakeholders. Uh, so right to the toolkits, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about the toolkit that Queen's have so the port was obviously one of our case studies and it was led by us, but there are other case studies going on uh, and are just being written up at the moment. We can uh, circulate the, the findings from those case studies as well. So Galway looked at coastal tourism. Uh, there was a case study in aquaculture, commercial fishing, large scale tourism across the Atlantic arc, and then also on renewable energy. And these are all now being written up as kind of high level um, pathways that we report back to the European Commission uh, and the Atlantic Air Commission, but also to, to sectors to start kind of stimulating thinking about where these these industries are going over the next 20 uh, to 50 years. The toolkit that we're developing is a transition management toolkit. Uh, Christine will say a little bit more about how we use the transition management framework within the, within the project, but I can circulate the drafts of that and, and our high level findings uh, after the meeting if people are interested in it. COVID did have an impact in terms of developing impact and maybe getting back out talking to the stakeholders as much as we would like to. But just because the project is finishing, our, our interest in transitions uh, and the future of ports isn't. So if you're interested in what Christina talks about later, or you want to hear more about the other elements of Moses, uh, get in touch with me or Andrew or Christina. So I hope you enjoyed the webinar and I can hand over to Andrew now again. Thank you very much, Wes. Um, that's fantastic. Um, again, um, we just move straight on to Christina now. If you're if you're happy to share share your slides, um, that would be great. Uh, 
Okay, can you see my presentation, Andrew? Excellent, Christina, thank you. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Christina Kelly and I am a research fellow in the School of the Natural and Built Environment here in Queen's University. And I am one of the researchers involved in the MOSES project with my colleagues here at Queen's. The presentation is going to be an overview of the case study of Belfast Harbour that Wes just uh, outlined there, which was one of um, a number of, of uh, research modules within the MOSES project. And we're looking at transitioning towards port sustainability. It's just apologies, is this? So just some background information in terms of the maritime industry and, and trade. So uh, the maritime sorry, Christina, to just just stop you there. Um, I'm just seeing that the, the fr front slide, the top slide. The cover slide, is it? The cover slide, yeah. Is that moved on? No, no. Um, if you if, if you maybe go into slideshow. Yes, yeah. that's that's it now. Yeah. Apologies, is that moved on? That's moved on, yeah. OK, so apologies about that. Sorry, just some background information on the maritime industry. So it makes up about 90 percent of global trade by volume and 70 percent by value. So it's one of the most globalized and, and largest industry sectors in the world. International trade or seaborne trade and volumes reached 10.7 billion tonnes in 2017. So this represented a growth rate of 4% over the previous five years. And shipping was over 80% of the merchandise trade in terms of transport. So it's quite a, a significant sector. In terms of emissions, the global maritime transport has, it was estimated to emit around 950 million tonnes of CO2 annually, and this accounts for approximately 2.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, there was a study conducted by the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, where it looked at uh, potential growth in emissions, and they estimated that it could grow from between 50 to 250 percent by 2050. And that is quite uh, quite a, an extensive area to our growth area in terms of emissions. And with international shipping, it, it, it was it's estimated that the the emissions actually represent the, uh, the equivalent of the entire energy needs of, of Germany. So that's Europe's largest economy. So we've stated that there is a need to transition towards greater sustainability and, and particular decarbonisation. And I will reflect on this throughout the presentation, but I, I guess there is the policy and the legislative drivers there as well. And you've got the International Maritime Organization already committing to reducing emissions by 50 percent by 2050. So there is an incentive there for greater sustainability. In terms of port management and the shipping sector, it's quite complex. There are ports of varying functions, function roles and assets which are influenced by the economy, politics, geographical location. And often ports are, are managed under different forms of port administration and ownership, such as um, public-private ownership, uh, local government ownership, trust ports. Um, the management of ports in terms of legislation. Sorry, Christina, really sorry to interrupt you again, but it's not it's not moved on to the, the next slide. Uh, apologies about this. I, Okay. Are we on the port management? You're on port management regime, yeah. Um, but it's just, I think, if it's in the the slideshow setup, it just, um, it's just not, it's not moving on. Okay. You... I'll I'll check again when I move the the next slide. Sorry about this. Excellent. Sorry, Christina. Sorry. That's okay. Um. So, I, I was talking about the governance side of, of ports, so it's influenced by different legislation and regulations which are, um, I suppose, stipulated at an international, EU, national level, local authority level, and um, also different ports have their own types of innovation initiatives in terms of environmental or energy 
uh, sustainability initiatives, for example, the majority of ports now have their own environmental management and monitoring systems. They have environmental management policies in place. Some are members of the eco ports. These voluntary initiatives or designated green ports are, are also part of research projects where they are striving to be smart ports. In terms of um, types of barriers or constraints towards sustainability, the, the complexities of regulations, the, there's been an identified lack of data to monitor environmental impacts, a lack of standardization of data collection and reporting in terms of sustainability, um, lack of standardization across technological interventions, and there's the complexity of integrating customer requirements into emerging sustainability approaches. And also then there's competition between ports as well as competition between cities and ports for land use development. I'm just going to move to the next slide, Andrew. Yeah. As that's. I'm still getting port management regime. There we go. That's it. OK, can I? Is that in the outline view? Apologies for that. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just go with the outline view if, if that's easier. So we looked at transition studies, um, which has emerged in the last couple of decades. And transition is uh, an area of research which looks at this complexity, uncertainty, and dealing with persistent problems in terms of sustainability. And within transition studies, there's a concept around transition management. And it is a process of long term radical and structural change. Uh, it's characterized by the emergence of new structures, cultures and practices. And um, it's based around system innovation, which is required to address barriers to progress on environmental issues. So there is a four step process within transition management, and that's normally involves establishing a transition arena, envisioning process, experimentation, evaluation and reflexivity. Now, these um, steps are part of the transition, just transition management cycle, which we've used this framework in our case study with Belfast Harbour to see how we could help ports transition towards sustainability. So it's based around the concept of action research, participatory involvement and um, co-producing visions. And I'll, I'll explain how we use that framework in Belfast Harbour. Have you been able to see that, Andrew? The next slide. Okay. Yeah. So just in terms of the transition arena concept, we use that as a, an overarching frame to kind of bring stakeholders together. And in Belfast Harbour, we held a workshop in 2019, but we also had some online surveys and online interviews. And as part of that first phase, we wanted to bring stakeholders together with an interest in ports and sustainability. And we wanted to explore opportunities and challenges, identify drivers and barriers towards sustainability. We also identified priorities that would help to um, transition towards sustainability within Belfast Harbour. And as part of those initial research um, exploration, those first stages of the research, we, we noted that there was a focus on the short to medium term and there was an, a need for maybe beyond the medium term to, to look at a long term perspective in, in terms of sustainability. So taking the, the second step of a transition management cycle that looks at developing vision or envisioning a process, we uh, Belfast Harbour had already developed their vision to 2035, so they had um, within that strategy their own plans for uh, a smart, green, connected port, a waterfront port. So they had that vision set out. So we decided to emphasise on horizon scanning and future thinking. So beyond 2035, obviously there's the short and medium term, but we wanted to look a little bit further than that and see how we could and use an approach to maybe think about um, different pathways of achieving sustainability. And also within transition studies, there's an emphasis on the application of innovation and technology towards a flexible approach in terms of, of sustainability. So we looked at the academic literature and best practice. We looked at some of the bigger ports, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Antwerp, Hamburg, we looked at what they were doing there as well as some of the, the smaller ports and other environmental and sustainability initiatives. And from that, we developed a future pathway analysis and that was an approach that we 
that would be suitable to look at maybe how port can respond to a number of change drivers over the short, medium and long term. So it was building on that, those first phases of the research um, where we identified opportunities and challenges. And within the, the pathway analysis approach, we looked at examining external and internal change drivers, the potential impacts of those drivers over three time frames, so the short, medium and long term. And then we identified some scenarios that could uh, represent responses or actions to the different drivers and we describe those by way of pathways or narratives. This is just an illustration where we showed the different time frames. So we looked at 2025, 2035 and 2050 and the different drivers we used a pestle framework. So looking at political, environmental, social, technological, economic and legal drivers. And then we looked at potential responses of these different pathways and they were named Stable Future, which is basically looking at past current trends, using predictions to, to formulate responses and, and a plan. Disruption Resilience Approach, which is based on the, the need to uh, respond to external pressures, um, looking at disruption, but also an adaptability um, where there's uncertainty. And it was more around the medium term. And then we looked at an, a managed innovation approach, which again uses the, a long term perspective, but the application of innovation and technology flexibly to achieve sustainability. This is, again, it's just an illustration where we mapped the different drivers and what the potential impacts could be using uh, the different pathways. So what would a stable future look like in 2025? What would a disruptive resilience pathway look like? Or, a managed innovation over those different time periods. So what we did was we described the different scenarios over the different time frames and potential responses to them. And we described them as narratives in a pathways report, which we circulated to a number of the stakeholders with Belfast Harbour also. And we wanted to find out, you know, how they thought Belfast Harbour was planning for the future, but also how their own organisations with an interest in ports and sustainability, how they also looked at the longer term perspective or, or what tools they use to, to think over the longer term. And we asked a, a number of questions around drivers, you know, that we highlighted a number of drivers, if there was any drivers that we had potentially overlooked or need to consider. And also the pathways that we had described were that, that they reflect realistically what could potentially happen or you know, so we were looking feedback on that as well. So just from the case study finds, we we worked with 10 other organisations. So we had interviews with them, online interviews. And from those different um, interviews and um, the questions on the pathways, they we find that there was, uh, I suppose, the, there was this uh, reluctance or some organisation were disinclined to plan beyond the medium term. That's not just Belfast Harbour, but other organisations. And that future thinking to date have been based around financial and infrastructure planning cycles and, and risk management approaches. Also, there was the some stakeholders had felt that this economic model of continuous growth maybe was unrealistic given, you know, the need to look at resources and planetary boundaries, especially with climate change impacts. And what is happening at the moment. In terms of uh, reactive or proactive responses, and uh, given the timing of this of this research with Brexit and the COVID-19 pandemic, the, uh, some of the stakeholders felt that there was a lack of planning or foresight there for you know these uncertainties. In terms of climate change impacts and adaptation, some of the stakeholders again felt that this wasn't to the forefront and there was a, almost like a, a lack of urgency that other, again, priorities were taking place in the short to medium term. However, climate change mitigation was seen as a, a massive opportunity for the ports and shipping sector. And already there was initiatives being mentioned and highlighted, uh, which would contribute towards decarbonisation. I think you know, one example was Artemis there and the, the, the potential there to have zero carbon emission vessels in Belfast Harbour in the not too distant future. So there's great potential there as well for climate change mitigation. 
But with that, there's a need for greater investment in training these new technologies, engineering, manufacturing and design. And also leading on from that, there was, uh, I suppose, the promotion of greater collaboration between port, city administrations, academia, business and local communities. And I just highlighted one quote there from one of the, the interviewees who said that government systems that are built on collaboration, equality, diversity and mixed gender tend to do better than others. Again, the, where we had looked at uh, international best practice, it was highlighted too is that you know we need to be sure of scalability and, and timing issues that you know different ports of different sizes are moving at different I suppose speeds of progress and to bear that in mind and there was also some uh, a belief that maybe there was a hesitancy to grasp innovation and take risks that it was I mean the potential was there and there was the planning there but sometimes it was very much around risk management and uh, less of an evaluation of acting versus not acting. Um, again, building on, on on the current situation, there was that some stakeholders felt that there was a lack of business diversity within the the harbour state. I, I guess you know building on that, surviving economic shocks from recent situations such as Brexit and, and COVID, and also again there was a, a new demand some of the stakeholders felt for this human experience instead of service provision you know that looking at natural capital green spaces recreation leisure as well with around that the waterfront the belfast harbour estate also it was noted that regulatory barriers such as legislation the lack of legislation lack of policy uh, tend to hamper innovation for example like the offshore renewables and renewable sectors that there just wasn't that I suppose political commitment or legislation there to to drive that innovation and there was some uncertainty over the role of ports in contributing to citywide change people weren't sure of, of where the Belfast Harbour was situated and what how they could contribute to citywide change and just I suppose to, to, to finalize that the finds were that the when we had presented the different pathways on the stable futures the resilient um, and disruptive approach or the managed innovation. The majority supported a managed innovation approach over the longer term. But the, this approach should foster the resilience and adaptability of the of, of the of the disruptive approach as well as embracing innovation and technology to steer long term change. So just I suppose in terms of the, the recommendations, we felt that the use of a pastel framework, which is looking at the drivers initially before um looking at potential responses so using you know uh, over the short term and medium term and long term looking at political economic social technological legal and environmental drivers over you know certain time frames could allow an organization reports or to to think about you know what what could potentially be the responses to that and not just think of one but maybe different scenarios and then work backwards towards the steps needed to reach those end goals over the longer term. Um, we recommend using a future pathways analysis approach that similar to the one that we took. We felt that by you know, involving stakeholders in looking at different scenarios and different responses and, and imagining potential outcomes that it was useful to help finalise or, or to think about where do we want to go and what steps do we need to, to, to address before we I suppose commit to fully planning on, uh, on, a, on a particular agenda, a transition agenda. And the participatory process that brings stakeholders together to explore future development uh, has been very useful that we find. In terms of our recommendations, as Moses is an EU project, how could regional authorities or regional assemblies use you know, our research or findings will feel that, you know, collaborating with key stakeholders at EU and national, regional and local level, that we can, it could be useful to promote enhanced coordination and sustainability in regional or local economic strategies, looking at transitions, looking at su sustainability for ports and maybe using this as a, to optimise EU policy and funding instruments for innovative port infrastructure. So just in terms of the next steps, Wesley had mentioned that uh, you know the, the project has been extended and although the case study is, is, is near in completion, we would 
hope to make, well, we will make the findings from all the case studies available, but we're keen to be part of discussions about the future of Belfast Harbour. And we're also uh, taking part in, in other research projects where we're working with other ports in the south of Ireland and looking at coastal transition in terms of energy projects. And we will make these findings available to Belfast Harbour and any interested stakeholders as well if they want to contact us. And we'll also make a lot of the information available on the Moses website. So I just want to wrap up by thanking um, thanking everybody for joining today and for listening in on the case study, but in particular Belfast Harbour staff for supporting the research, for giving up their time and resources to, uh, as part of, uh, of, our, our, of our work. And also the local stakeholders that we went out to and participated in interviews and workshops and online questionnaires. So uh, we really appreciate their their input and just to acknowledge our funders and uh, if there's any other questions I'd be happy to take those or, or wait till after Trevor speaks. I apologise for the disruptions in the earlier slides Andrew, I, th I thought that when it, it, no. the slideshow animation should roll fairly smoothly. Not at all Christina, these uh, I think these things these, these happen um, I think but no it was great really really great presentation Christina really um, enjoyed it. Um, I think um, just to keep with the, the running order, we might we might wait for questions till the end if if that's okay. Um, what I want to do now is um, I'm going to share. I'm going to introduce um, Trevor Anderson from Belfast Harbour, um, who's going to talk a little bit, um, as I said at the start, about some of the activities at the harbour and also its its relationship with the, the Moses project. Uh, but, Trevor, if you could unmute yourself, that would be great. And I, I will share your your presentation so you can um, you can talk through it if that's OK. No problem. Can you hear me OK, Andrew? I, I can, yes. So I'm just going to okay. set this up and then hopefully we can um, we can start moving through it. OK, can you put it on the slideshow mode and see if it works OK? okay. Look okay. Yeah, that's perfect. If we just start there, um, let, let's go to the next slide, Andrew. Um, hi, everybody. Pleasure to, to be here and, and have the opportunity to to speak uh, to this and uh, to support the Moses project. Let, let me say a few brief words uh, just for orientation uh, about Belfast Harbour. Um, the picture you see on your screen is um, shows the harbour. Um, the, it, it's essentially most of the land enclosed within that major road network that you see forming a U-ship uh, on the picture, uh, and that's all reclaimed land. It, it's 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 a very unnatural harbour in many sense because it all had to be carved out of uh, out of the seabed, uh, and the the land uh, reclaimed to form the structures that you see there. Um, the other thing I would say about the harbour uh, is that it's it's very close to the city centre. There's only about 600 metres um, from the, the, the closest part of the harbour uh, to the city hall. Um, so on one hand, you've got the city um, and you've got all of the implications that being a, a major industrial harbour in the heart of the city, uh, that means. On the other hand, there's, there's quite a lot of... Um, sensitive nature around us within the harbour estate itself there's a couple of hundred acres of uh, bird reserve and, and wildlife reserve and at the mouth of the harbour that you see there um, you know you've got um, special protection areas and, and areas of special scientific interest etc uh, and like all harbours the harbour is going seawards as ships become larger over time and the um, the land and the quaysides that uh, have shallower drafts uh, become obsolete and then get given over to urban regeneration as new land and new quaysides are created further out to sea to be able to to welcome the um, the larger ships and of course that encroaches into mussel farming and and you know special protection areas so there's always challenges there. Um, 
the harbour, just in terms of scale, is is large. It, it handles two thirds of the region's trade. It's about the tenth largest harbour in the United Kingdom, um, but it's it's very large from a, a real estate perspective. So it's two thousand acres of um, of land and another thousand acres of water. Um, there's seven hundred and sixty odd businesses within the harbour state and a growing residential population and a, and a large tourism and leisure component within the harbour estate. Uh, so the, the nature of the harbour estate as, as it develops these lands that are left behind from you know historical, now obsolescent quaysides uh, is, is changing. And I thought that was interesting, the diversity comment about the harbour because you know through the 2007 economic downturn and the current challenges with COVID, the harbour's business model has, has been hugely resilient. And part of that's the inherent attractiveness of harbour business models in general, but part of it is also the, the diversity uh, of the harbour business model, which now includes things like leisure industry, tourism, creative industry, the knowledge economy, um, and, and many others. So the, there is a very diverse um, business model there. If, if we flick on, Andrew, uh, just to the next slide. As Christina mentioned a couple of years ago, we, we really re-examined our um, strategic um, plans and, and looked out to 2035 um, to, to inform uh, or, or strategic thought process. And, and I have to say that the work that we've been doing with the Moses Project has been tremendously helpful in terms of challenging our thinking and channeling our thinking in, in some of these areas. But we organized our thinking into these um, five major themes. So world's best regional port um, and a, an iconic waterfront for the city, which reflects the development of those um, lands for urban regeneration, but also creating a, a key economic hub uh, and a, an engine for economic growth for the area. And, and visualizing the harbor as less of a gateway for trade and more as a hub for where trade and economic growth takes place. The, the other two underpinning themes um, that, that really support those themes of you know developing a best regional port, developing a key economic hub and developing an iconic waterfront is that the whole concept of green port and sustainability and this whole idea of innovation and smart port. And I'll, I'll say a, a couple more words about those in a moment and they're very uh, closely connected um, with, with each other. So flick on, Andrew, for me. No problem. In terms of um, sustainability in Greenport, we have always thought that we've had a very strong green agenda. Um, you know, we've been either number one or number two in the local Northern Ireland um, environmental benchmarking study um, that, that takes the sort of T top 250 major companies in Northern Ireland and and ranks them and um, marks them against their environmental husbandry. But when we really started to look at, at our sustainability agenda, we realized that it wasn't really deep enough and, and far seeing enough and rich enough in, in many areas. So um, following on from the development of those um, five key strategic themes that, that you saw a couple of slides ago, um, we, we started to put a lot more flesh on the bones of our sustainability agenda. And, and we developed these six main themes of decarbonization, clean air and water, green development, resource efficiency, biodiversity and conformation, and at the core, um, this idea of informing, inspiring and transforming. If I, if I just take them one by one very briefly, reducing carbon um, is, is, is principally about energy and the operations of the harbour. Uh, so today we, we procure about 17 gigawatt hours of, of energy and redistribute about 12 gigawatt hours of that to our customers within the harbour. But that's all coming from the grid. 
And although we, we only buy green energy from the grid, you know, there are huge opportunities for um, developing sustainable energy solutions on the harbour estate, mostly through solar. Um, there's opportunities for private wire solutions from some of the energy companies within the harbour estate. There's lots of emerging opportunities to support initiatives in new innovative energy solutions such as hydrogen, smart grids, you know, all of those kind of things. Uh, and, and so we've expanded our um, strategy and initiatives in those areas to embrace uh, all of those things. The other dimension of, of energy management is, is really about moving away from fossil fuels. So the electrification of, of the harbour's fleet of plant and equipment and where electrification isn't possible, moving to, to greener fuels or moving to, to hybrid uh, plant and equipment. Um, air quality and, and water quality. Um, air quality ranges from um, you know, dust management to traffic emissions. Um, water quality, the challenge there to some extent is we can do so much about um, the water quality from a lot of our own operations but some of the water quality challenges are what comes down the river through Belfast Harbour. So some of that's about collaborating and working with, with upstream organisations. Um, green developer, I think this is, this is one of the areas where we've expanded our thought process considerably. Our approach to green developer in the past was, you know, achieve Brian excellence for the, the built product that we're delivering. Um, but there's a lot more now we're getting into in terms of reaching further into the the value chain in terms of you know construction materials and uh, further into the ownership of the building and extending green practices to our, our our tenants and our customers throughout the life of the building. Resource efficiency and and management of resources across the state. Um, huge efforts have gone into that in terms of engaging our, our staff and engaging other companies in the state about um, symbiotic arrangements with regards to raw materials um, and really looking to reinforce recycling and, and reuse and uh, reduction of consumption. Biodiversity, um, well, I mean, Biodiversity, I think, is an interesting challenge. We've, we've had a biodiversity charter for, for a number of years now, but we're always looking for ways to, to find out how we can increase the net biodiversity within the harbour. And again, that involves working with a lot of the organisations in the harbour. And I think in, in terms of dealing with that inspire, inform and, and transform discussion, it's important to understand that what the harbour is in that respect. With 760 odd businesses in the harbour estate, um, the harbour is, is more about the place where business happens as opposed to just being an organisation. Um, so, you know, there's 25,000 people work in the harbour estate, but only 150 of them work for Belfast Harbour. So, achieving sustainability is as much as taking a leadership role and engaging with all of those other entities and, and helping them uh, to adopt sustainable practices. If we just move on, Andrew. No problem. Thanks. Closely linked um, to sustainability is a key enabler of our strategic themes is the whole idea of smart port and innovation. Um, and since we developed the strategic themes, we've also spent quite a bit of time over the last two years really fleshing out our digital ambition and our digital and innovation roadmap. And we kind of come up with this strap line to, to help us organize our thoughts of supporting our journey to be the world's best regional port, unlocking new levels of sustainability, agility, productivity and value generation for the harbour and its stakeholders through partnership, innovation, processes and technology. So that whole idea of partnership is key. Um, the whole idea of innovation uh, and unlocking new levels that previously we couldn't achieve through more traditional means uh, is fundamental to the thought process here. If you just move on, Andrew. So not to spend a huge amount of time on, on this slide. Um, 
But there's a few things on this that show the connection between sustainable growth and, and innovation. So at the core of our innovation agenda are a number of key things. One is providing connectivity um, throughout the harbour estate and beyond that enables um, productivity within the harbour estate, um, enables capabilities such as mobility, people working throughout that 2,000 acre estate having access to the information on a timely fashion to be able to do their work efficiently without having to return to the office to get information or to update information. Um, Internet of Things solutions so that all of the assets within the Harbour Estate can be monitored remotely and can be managed in a more predictive maintenance oriented fashion and all of that requires connectivity. But the connectivity um, and that that is particularly enabled wirelessly through 5G solutions is key to supporting um, the, the, the services to our uh, stakeholders within the estate and to our new growing iconic waterfront stakeholders. So providing that kind of high connectivity, high speed, low latency um, facilities to either the universities who are based in the Harbour State who can use it uh, for research purposes or some of the med tech and fintech companies um, or indeed creative industries who are coming into the Harbour State who can leverage that kind of connectivity to create jo uh, growth and, and new jobs uh, is key. Or even just the man in the street who is now a visitor or a resident in the Harbour State uh, in terms of giving him uh, or her public um, telephone services with fast broadband uh, in a wireless uh, sense. So a core enabling capability of, of growth is, is that digital dimension. And, and that's very closely linked to the sustainability agenda because we're using those 5G private networks uh, for a number of critical sustainability initiatives at the moment. One is um, real-time air monitoring and control. Um, the second one is um, smart traffic management because a key component for us of decarbonisation and air quality is better management of, of road traffic. Uh, and one of the key projects that we have underway this year is a smart traffic solution whereby we are monitoring traffic throughout Belfast and uh, providing uh, information to our commuters through apps and through desktop solutions to help them understand the commuting choices that they have uh, better and to help them better plan their, uh, their journey home using active and sustainable transport solutions, but where they're still in their private car, uh, help them to, to navigate traffic congestion better uh, to avoid emissions. That solution will go live later this year. So there's a very strong link between some of those innovation solutions and, and the sustainability agenda. Um, I think that's pretty much all I had to cover, Andrew. I think that's the last slide. Excellent, Trevor. Thank you so much for that. That was really, uh, that was really, really interesting. Um, you know, again, a lot of, a lot of content there. Um, and again, along with what, what Christina said and, and, and Wesley, um, I think that leads us nicely into a, into a discussion. Um, what, um, how maybe we, we can go about this. Um, if you do want to, to ask a question, um, you know, either raise your hand. I am seeing some of you and um, some of you have got your cameras on. Um, some of you haven't. Um, if I don't pick on you and you do want to ask something, um, even if you give me a little private message in the in the message bar, um, that might be useful too. So um, I'm happy to open the floor. Um, if there's anybody to wants to start off, uh, maybe introduce yourself as well. That might be be useful too um, before you before you you set your question. Well, 
if we've not got got anyone to, to start, I might I've actually got a, a, a quick question. Um, and it, it's, it's project related, um, but it's mainly to try and to see from the research, has there really been any examples of, of best practice um, that have emerged, uh, particularly with port management? Um, it, it could be through some of the case studies or just through some of the, the general research. So um, if I if I could pose that one. Thanks, Andrew. I, yeah, I, I, we looked at, I suppose, the, the, the well-known ports, Rotterdam and, and Amsterdam and, and what they're doing. And I suppose to touch on what Trevor mentioned about the innovation and the uh, the technology, what Belfast Harbour are doing there. I suppose in Rotterdam, they have used uh, very in, intelligent, smart Internet of Things systems where they are I suppose increasing efficiencies and effectiveness around the port so that uh, you know you have sensors on ships and sensors around the state so that everything's connected everybody knows what's happening in real time and then I suppose it, in terms of port activities the ships that are coming in that you know they know if there's a space at the harbour available to prevent that I suppose the delays and with the prevention of delays you've got the prevention of emissions and the air quality issues so there's a, a lot there in terms of technology. Those bigger ports, obviously, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, there's you know the, the scale there and, and the investment. So but seeing what they're doing and, and obviously what Trevor's mentioned with, with Belfast, what they're doing there, they're starting to, you know, connect, to link, to talk to each other in real time to see what's happening. And again, that, you know, efficiency, reducing delays, um, the traffic management, again, that's all contributing to sustainability and you know, hopefully, you know, in terms of emissions and the reductions and striving towards decarbonisation. So there is a lot happening. And I think even though you have the bigger ports, what's happening in the medium size of smaller ports? And um, there's examples of, you know, collaboration in the smaller ports where they're looking at the hinterland, looking at the impacts of the traffic management from the ports on, you know, the, the rural areas and the countryside and, and working there. That's more working uh, collaboratively with stakeholders and councils, again, in traffic management there in relation to emissions. Um, other example, I mean, we've got Artemis as well on our doorstep. There's a great example of innovation and, and technology there. And Belfast, you know, was been mentioned before is a great location site, the airports, the university research here as well. You know, from, um, our own locality. Best practice there. So yeah, there's a there's a lot. I probably only mentioned a couple, but in our reports that we'll make available, there's some good examples and links there to to best practice. Excellent, Christina. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, I've actually just got a, a, a question. Is there anything you would like to add, Trevor or Wes, or are, are you OK? And maybe make a very brief comment just on what Christine says. Um, so, you know, we, we've collaborated a lot with um, Port of Rotterdam in particular to, to understand how some of the lessons learned. And, you know, one of the key things is, is this idea within a port community system of being able to empower the whole port value chain um, with information to help people make better decisions. And as Christine says in the, um, in the Port of Rotterdam, it's mostly about managing shipping arrivals to avoid um, congestion at the port and, and ships emissions at the port whenever they, they, they're queuing to get in and providing the opportunity for those ships to slow steam and, and have less emissions on their journey to the port. Within a port like Belfast Harbour, it, it's less, the, the value proposition is less that because we rarely have, have ships uh, queuing for the port in the same way as Rotterdam would do. But they're taking the same idea, there's a huge opportunity to try to empower the inland value chain with, with information. So if you can share information about cargoes more effectively, if you imagine the um, the, the local haulier who's driving his truck to the port to pick up a cargo, if he's much better informed and can much better plan his activities, then he's less likely to incur waiting time on his asset 
uh, and his asset is less likely to be sitting in the port with his engine idling, emitting, uh, you know, carbon um, dioxide, etc. Um, so that whole idea of empowering the value chain with information is is something that that we've picked up in terms of best practice, albeit maybe likely to apply slightly differently. Thanks, Trevor. That's great. Um, it was it was kind of nip and tuck between Claire and Mark, um, but I think Claire just about got in there first. So if you if you'd like to to make a question or a follow up. Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that, Mark. That boat has to be a bit faster. <laughs> be me. Um, just a comment, basically. Don't really you worry about that, Claire. <laughs> I'm going to regret saying that, aren't I, Mark, in about two years now. Um, just really welcome the report. Fantastic that you've thought through all of these propositions and the future pathways. Just to let you know that we're doing something similar and the same issues are coming up in the City Council. Decarbonisation of our assets and that's our buildings, our fleet. You know, I'm really pushing the Council on electric vehicles. We're going to examine some hydrogen powered technology for the future. Um, and we also have a big land base. So all those climate adaptation issues that we're going to have to face in terms of, you know, perhaps flooding and stuff that there's a lot of there's a lot of connectivity there and connection. And I'm thinking at the moment about a city energy plan. Um, uh, we know there's an energy strategy being written, but I think there's a lot we could do in the city collaboratively and together to bring, you know, ideas together, whether that's on microgrids, you know, EV infrastructure. You know, this decarbonisation agenda is disrupting and changing everything and it's creating new opportunities. And if we're not there, you know, working on the innovation from day one collaboratively, I think we're going to um, uh, we're going to um, miss out on some of the opportunities. But just to say, you know, really welcome this. Um, we're doing something similar. And of course, the whole digital side and how they parallel you know, the digital and the decarbonisation are the areas for the future that the government are going to invest in. Um, so there's just some comments from my side, but you know, well done, and um, I think this uh, can actually stimulate another big discussion that we probably wouldn't have had two years ago. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, thanks for those comments. Pre appreciate it. Um, if we just move to Mark now quickly, because I think we've we've also got some questions in the um, in the notes as well. So if 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 you if you make your point, Mark, that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, so, I mean, it's just a general point, just listening to, to what Trevor was saying. And, and I think sometimes you need to go away and come back again to realise what you actually have here uh, in Northern Ireland. And Trevor's comment about the port, the harbour and its proximity to the city centre and just this ability to collaborate and collaborate very easily and literally walk around uh, your consortium members mustn't be uh, sort of underestimated. So I think from a ability to be able to demonstrate and demonstrate it at a nation scale uh, in, in a relatively contained environment, when you look at that picture that Trevor showed with, with it on the harbour and the complexity of what's there, I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, you've got an airport, you've got uh, complex operations, you've got people living in the vicinity uh, and within 15 minutes walk, you're, you know, or less, you're, you're into, this, into the city hall. So I think in terms of now, the reason we're we're in Belfast is exactly because of that. Uh, and, you know, and as Claire mentioned, uh, the, the engagement from the city councils. I mean, we're interested on in demonstrating, uh, obviously, the zero emissions water ferries, but it's no good if we can't get the people on the ferry and off the ferry and into the workplace and having that end to end first and last mile of zero emissions, too. So this this is, you know, exactly what we're, you know, Dead, dead keen to be involved and collaborate on, on activity like this. But, but I, again, I would just say, uh, say sometimes we forget how lucky we are uh, uh, as a nation and, and the, the geographic strengths of, of what we've actually got here to demonstrate real bold asks, such as hydrogen infrastructure uh, or, or, or battery tech and zero emissions at scale and at pace. And on that, I'll be quiet. <laughs> 